the, the thing with YouTube that TikTok and Instagram don't have is the it's leverageable forever, right? You spend two hours, three hours making one video and that video could literally prospect for you for the rest of your career. Like I have, you know, videos that I put out when I first started YouTube almost a year ago that are still like, if you look at the views on the analytics, it's still just going up in a straight line like this, right? Like it hasn't stopped. So, and you know, I have another, there's another agent in my market. I was talking to him. He closed two deals off a YouTube that he shot three years ago last month. So, you know, the way that I look at it on YouTube, like TikTok can get you deals today. Like I shot a video on a presale last week and then I got a text. They're like, hey, I put a deposit down on one of those units on that video that you shot and put your name on the contract. <laughs> I you're pretty crazy. To the guy, right? So yeah, you met like, the guy and you're getting credit for it. That's crazy. Yeah. Like that's how powerful TikTok is. Like TikTok will get you business today, but YouTube will build a sustainable business for the rest of your career, right? Like the way I look at it is just like every video I put out is somebody sitting in a call center making cold calls for me. And I want to put out as many of those videos as I can. So the question is this, how do most agents succeed in today's competitive real estate market when all the successful agents are keeping the secrets to themselves? So that's the question. And this podcast will give you the answer. I interview agents from all over the world. I ask them their tactics and they share all of their secrets with me so we can give them to the world. I'm Aaron Amuchastegui and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Hey, Real Estate Rockstars, this is your host, Aaron Amuchastegui. You are in for a treat today. I'm getting really, really excited about this interview. We're going to talk about social media. We're going to talk about real estate and probably the difference of uh, real estate in some areas in Canada compared to the U.S. I get the interview. Connor Kelly today. Let's see if I get this, this location right from Abbotsford, Canada. Did I get that name right? Yes, sir. Awesome. So what's up, man? How long have you been in real estate? Yeah, man. Glad to be on. Thank, thank you for having me on, Aaron. And uh, I've been in real estate now coming up on only two years in the next two weeks. So it's been a wild ride. It's been awesome, man. Better than I ever thought it would have ever went. So yeah. And so even though it's two years, you've done a bunch of transactions. You've got a lot of cool things that are working out. And I think for, you know, new agents that are listening, I think this, this interview is going to be really important for you guys about how you could grow really, really quickly. Uh, in your business and some tactics that Connor's been using. And also, if you're one of those agents right now that you're just kind of stuck and things aren't working like they used to, and last year's business plan, you could do open or two years ago, you could do open houses and get 20 leads and convert them to something. And now you're looking for a pivot or something to put fuel on the fire. People that have had recent success. You think about it, you became an agent in the last two years. And I would say um, in, in Texas, in California, in uh, Colorado, and a lot of markets, the last two years has been some of the toughest two years in real estate. Um, you know, it, like 2021, end of 2021 was pretty on fire, but pretty early in 2022, things have slowed down a lot. So you've been successful during it and growing during a time when that's challenging. So what made you decide to get into real estate? Yeah, that's a good question. I was a plumber for nine years. I didn't enjoy what I did. I made good money doing it. Come from a blue collar family, have like three mechanics in the family, but I just felt like, I was spending a lot of time doing stuff that I hated doing. Like you sleep for eight hours and then you work 60 hours a week doing something you don't like doing. And at this point in my life, I was investing in real estate. I stumbled across the Bigger Pockets real estate podcast, which people in, in your market probably know very well. Not a lot of people yep. in Canada listen to it, but I found it and I listened to it religiously. And that led to me buying my first investment property. But then I realized I was like, even with this income, it's still going to take me like 15 years to get out of plumbing and actually go do what I want to do. So I'm like, why don't I just go do what I want to do right now? I noticed everybody on the Bigger Pockets real estate podcast, like seemed like everyone started as a realtor. Like 50% of the people on that podcast were all realtors turned investors kind of thing or vice versa, right? So I'm like, that just seems like the natural, you know, progression for a real estate investor is get licensed and then you learn real estate a lot quicker and you see the deals as they come to you and and then I'll I'll become a real estate investor. But what ended up happening was I got my license and uh, I started doing this social media thing. That took off really fast. And now I found a new passion in social media. So yeah, it's such a, a uh, like when people want to become investors, right? They listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast and they get all these sorts of different downloads. I've been on, I've been on there a couple times. My friends are are the hosts of uh, of the podcast, and um, the 
it's funny, like one of their most highly downloaded episodes was this waitress that was working as a waitress full time, but she was able to like buy houses on the side. And so there's essentially two ways you can become an, I guess the biggest way, the, one of the best ways to become an investor, two ways you can become a full-time investor. Like you're just a full-time investor, but it's, you usually have to have money come from somewhere. And so like some of that angles, like, oh, people do deals and they wholesale and, and do things like that. But it's easier to like start to build an investment portfolio if you have an income. So you had this income as a plumber, you were making good money as a plumber. So now you had good W2 income. You could get a loan, you could have down payment money saved up. So you're like, cool. So what you need to become an investor in real estate is you need like income, like personal income that you're working for. We call it vertical income. Like you're going to a job or you're working for it. But if you stopped working this month, you wouldn't get paid next month. So that's like the vertical income that we're working for. And, you know, and then as an investor, you buy a house, you make money on it. And maybe you're not working anymore. That's the dream. Um, so yeah, you had that option of doing it as a plumber and investing, but you also said, but I love real estate. I don't like plumbing. So what if I can make real estate, my, my W2 per se, for lack of a better term, like my vertical income, that thing that I'm working for every month to make money. And then it gives me some money to do the other stuff. And I think it is a natural trend. Yeah. Yeah. And I just kind of took the approach and I even took the approach in real estate too. And that's why I started the social media thing is I was just like, life is so short. Why am I doing stuff that I hate doing? You know what I mean? And like, even you always, you always hear people preach like in your business, play to your strengths and hire out your weaknesses. Right. So I'm like, I didn't like cold calling. I didn't like plumbing. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. So I just built my business around stuff that I actually enjoy doing. And I actually enjoy social media. I like it. And you know, I like the results from it. I like being able to connect with all these people in the comments and stuff like that. I like instantly seeing that result of now the video is finished and then instantly there's like the likes and the comments. I know it sounds terrible, whatever, but you know, you get that instant gratification for posting a video. Right. So I enjoyed it. Right. And I just removed the stuff that I didn't like doing out of my life. You know, and I love social media. It's um, I love the relationships I build on there. I built, I've become friends with people that I interview on the podcast. Our friendship gets deeper through social media. And then we end up like doing trips together and hanging out or they come out to our mastermind in Austin. Like we have all these different things where it starts. But, but the funny thing is you can also have a friend that you, you know, that you meet once, then you like interact on social media for like nine months. And the next time you see them, it's like, you've been hanging out the whole time. It's, it's this really fascinating phenomenon that I think that we're lucky to be alive during the part of it. I mean, I remember when it first came out, the idea that you could, you know, meet people through social or get business through social. It was kind of, it's, it's baffling that it works. Um, but it definitely does work. So, so yeah. So, so uh, one random question, have you looked into like threads yet? Instagram threads yet? Man, I was going hard on threads when it first came out. I was posting like 20 a day and then the app glitched. I like, sent a bunch of tickets and everything. They can't seem to fix it on my phone. I've uninstalled, reinstalled, whatever. So I'm just like, I don't know what to do anymore. It just doesn't work on my phone. But to answer your question, I think threads is great. I think... So here's the thing, right? You probably know this too, is um, everything is basically based on supply and demand, even these social media apps. So what ends up happening when a new app comes out is you have all these consumers that migrate over to the app, but all of the people who actually create content, which is like less than 1% of the population, they don't want to have to take the time to go through the learning curve of learning this new app. So you have all these consumers migrate over, but only a small portion of the creators go over to that app. So then there's a supply and demand imbalance of all the people consuming content, barely anybody creating it. And therefore, anything you create, it's a lot easier for your stuff to show up on their feed, right? So anytime a new social media app comes out, you're going to have that supply demand imbalance, right? So it's, it's a great opportunity as a creator to get over there and just pick up reach, pick up some digital real estate, some eyeballs. Well, it's still really easy, right? Yeah. You talk about the instant gratification. One thing that's been discouraging for threads because I too, like I was like, all right, I'm going to go over there fast. I'm not, I'm going to be I'm going to be earlier this time because I remember when it was like, oh, you should get a TikTok for business. It's like, no, it's just for kids. All these different places where the people that were early blew up. But I love the instant gratification too. And I've had the toughest time with going like, all right, there's 5,000 followers here. And I got one like on my comment <laughs> or I got like one like on my post because there isn't much interaction happening there yet. So it's kind of fizzled out for me because I post a video or something on Instagram and within an hour I'm having a dozen conversations and it wasn't happening so far there. So I think it's to be determined uh, if it's going to, you know, what thing it's going to have. But I, but I like the mindset of like, no, anytime something's new, 
go hard, but I'm discouraged over there. So maybe I should keep going. But like, I love the instant gratification too. And I was not getting the same uh, outcome over there yet. Well, I, I think it's different now too, because now everybody knows that on the new platform, reach is going to be a lot easier. So it's not like the last couple of times where it's like now everybody has seen that happen time and time again. So there's probably a lot more creators instantly going over to threads thinking like, well, if I'm an early adopter of this, I should blow up like so-and-so did on Instagram and TikTok and whatever. And that's probably hurt that supply demand imbalance that would normally be there on a new app. But even still, it's it still should be in theory regardless, easier to grow on that app than it would be on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, right? I think it just comes down to consistency like anything else, right? Yeah. Yeah. With the same amount of effort, with the same amount of content, with the same amount of consistency, and then figuring out why, you know, and then tailoring your content a little bit different for like the, it, it looks different than the other one. It looks similar to Twitter. It looks different than Instagram. So it's like, you know, changing your content to be like for that app, but pushing out as much effort I think that's probably the best advice people could get with that. So two years ago, you said, I'm going to become an agent. So yeah. I love social media. I'm not going to go cold call. I'm not going to go door knock. I'm going to grow a business through social media. So then what did you, so how did that start? And what does that mean at the beginning? Like, what did you do and how did that start converting? Yeah. So actually I was cold calling and door knocking in the beginning. I was making like 75 cold calls as door knocking two, three times a week. But you know, just like the supply demand imbalance thing, Gary V was talking about TikTok since it was called Musically when it was literally an app for dancing kids, right? So I was like, I'm going to try out this TikTok thing. I'm just going to implement it into my daily schedule. When I sit down to do my calls, I'll post one TikTok in the morning and just see what happens because apparently the reach on there is amazing. Well, lucky for me, the second video that I posted, which was about a rental property I owned in Ontario, blew up. It got like 150,000 views. And wow. at that point, I was like, I didn't even think this was going to get me business, right? I was just like, you know, it's better than a bus bench ad. This is definitely getting me some brand awareness at the very least, right? So I'm like, that's a lot of views. I'm just going to keep posting on here and seeing what happens, right? And then a month and a half later, I went to, uh, you guys call it, I think, pre-construction there, a new construction. We call them pre-sales, pre-sale condos. I went to a pre-sale condo center. I shot a video. Next to me, I had a bunch of leads. I ended up closing four in an afternoon, selling four of them in an afternoon. And that was basically, you know, like six, seven months of my plumbing income in that afternoon. And that's when I was like, hey, this TikTok stuff is real, right? Like from that moment on, I pretty much stopped cold calling and door knocking, just doubled down on social media and started posting more. And then by the end of that first year, I ended up doing 57 deals. And I want to say like 40 to 45 of them came pretty much 100% through TikTok. Hey listeners, Aaron here. I just want to tell you about something I'm super, super excited about. You know, a couple months ago, I had a bunch of people in my office in Austin and I taught what I called my foreclosure masterclass. It was to teach investors how to make money with the stressed real estate investing through foreclosures and other sorts of leads that are out there of people that are desperate to sell or need to sell and maybe they don't even know it yet and that process. Well, we had so much fun when people, everyone came to the office. So many people said they wanted to do it again. I recorded the class. It's now live and available for purchase. So if you're interested in learning about becoming an investor and learning about becoming an investor agent, being able to educate yourself uh, some more around foreclosures, about distressed real estate and how to get those, go to the foreclosuremasterclass.com, the foreclosuremasterclass.com. All right, back to the podcast. So let's dissect two of those videos. So your first video is about a rental property you have. How long was it? What did you say? What, is, if, it, what, what did that one look like? I literally just said, hey, I bought this property for this much. It's worth this much. These are the numbers. This is what it rented for when I got it. This is what it rents for now. And this is the monthly cash flow. And that was it. And it blew up because it was so easy. The platform was so easy. Like Now it's gotten hard. Uh, harder, I should say, but it's still the most reach you're going to get out of any of these platforms. But it was just so simple. It's just, this is what I did. This is what I bought. These are the numbers. And it, it just blew up. But I noticed anytime you talk about real estate, it's like a sensitive subject now. Like if you talk about like rental property or landlords or tenants or whatever, it's like everything just blows up because people just lose their minds in the comment section, which I, I didn't even know was a thing until I got my real estate license, right? So yeah. it's, it was like a touchy subject for people that I owned a rental property, I guess. Yeah, there's pros and cons. We invest in foreclosures and have rentals and things like that. And you get just so many people that hate it, that that love it and aspire to be it. So video, so another video soon after that, either the next one or soon after that, you went to a... A, you know, a, a new development that was happening and you yeah. did a video about that new development. And then people actually reached out to you about that development. 
So what did you say in the video about the new development where people were like, I want to, I want to hear more, you know, what do you do? Like, what was your, what was your video or call to action on that thing? I would have shot that video a lot different today, but I, the thing is I wasn't even in it. I literally just shot like, you know, 10, two second clips of the show unit in the presale center with some music over top of it and some text on the screen. Uh, and that was it. And then I just had my phone number in the bio and next time my phone number started blowing up and I was that, that was super surprising to me. I was like, people are calling me off of this app. This is crazy. Cause I had never heard of people getting deals off of TikTok, at least not in my market up until that point. And then, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it so it just started taking off from there. Like after that month, um, every month I w- probably every day I was getting you know two three people calling me off of TikTok from that point onwards. So, wow. so is TikTok still your biggest social media site you use? It's it is still, and and it, this is why it's so powerful for any local businesses. It's such a hack for realtors. So on TikTok, the uh, the algorithm pushes out your content based on your IP address. So it's going to show it to everybody in your local market first. And then based on how it's received, usually watch time, right? Like based on how long your video is, there's a certain percentage that the viewer needs to watch the video on average before the algorithm decides it's a good video to push out. And then it'll start showing it to people, you know, out of state or internationally or push it out nationally once it's received well within your local market. So, um, it's basically like a bus bench on steroids is kind of what I would call it because it's, it's free. You'll get way more views and people actually have something to connect with. It's not just, you know, a still photo of your face on a bench that costs thousands of dollars. It's, you know, they see your personality, they connect with you. They actually, you know, they know who you are from the videos that you make and they're seeing you every single day, as long as you're posting every single day. Right. So it it really is a bus bench on steroids. I think every local business should be, you know, posting every single day on TikTok. Yeah. So that I had never heard of the IP address thing, but that does make sense why it helps for realtors, especially if the if the the content you're sending out there is like, hey, here's a property in Austin. Here's a unique I live in Austin, Texas. Like here's a unique property in Austin, Texas. I went and toured one recently as a thirty million dollar um you know listing would be the most expensive. Uh, maybe it was 40 million, most expensive listing in Austin ever for a single, for a single family home. Wow. Right. It was like acreage on the, on, you know, on the lake. And so it's like, it's its own dock and all this stuff. But like, I could see that video first, you know, pushing that out on TikTok. It's going to first send it to people in Austin. So people in Austin are going to be more curious about it than people that live anywhere else. Exactly. Because they're going to say like, oh, a $40 million property in Austin. I've never even heard of that. They're going to look at the video and go, where is that? Do I know the area? Do I know the location? There's going to be more eyeballs on it because it's local. Exactly. So for agents, whether you're posting a video anywhere about a property, a unique property, something like that, you're going to essentially first is going to send it out to people in Austin. If people in Austin are more interactive on it, then it's going to go somewhere else. Where like a normal uh, post, if I post that same video on Instagram, it's going to equally distribute it across like my followers first and based on what they like, it will either grow or not. So if my, if the bulk of my followers cares about Austin real estate, then it'll push out to everybody. But because the bulk of my followers are not in Austin or not in real estate in Austin, they don't care. And so it wouldn't get that same reach. So I hadn't heard of that, but that makes a lot of sense. Why I guess why any realtors that aren't on TikTok should be. And even though th- now, even though there's a lot of people on there now, right? Like you got there at a good time. More people are on TikTok today than there were then. Um, was there any reason why a realtor shouldn't start doing it now if they haven't done it yet? Is it too late? No, it's definitely not too late. I mean, there's not a lot of comp- competition on TikTok at all. Like even less than YouTube, I would say. And there's barely any competition on YouTube as it stands. But at the end of the day, right? Everyone's always like, oh, this is saturated. I shouldn't do this anymore because it's saturated. Nothing is really saturated as long as you're being you, how is, how is you going to be saturated? You know what I mean? Like if you just hop on social media and you're yourself, you're playing in your own market because you're going to attract people just like you, right? Nobody can saturate you. You know what I mean? So like, just get on there, be yourself and make sure you post every single day and never miss, right? Like the biggest thing is just being consistent and nobody really does it consistently. And that's the problem, right? So like, if you're going to do it, get on there, be yourself and post every single day. Right. Yeah. The it's been, uh, it's one of the hacks I've seen lately with Instagram too. Like the friends that have done, you know, two reels a day, every day for the last 30 or 60 days, they've seen huge reach happens because one of the things that the apps like to see too is consistency. Yes. They, they don't want to bring you more followers. If you're not going to keep creating content, the goal of the app is to keep people on the app. So if they're, exactly. if you're proving to them like, Hey, I'm going to keep, you know, 
providing a bunch of content, then they, then they're going to want to help you grow your follower count. They're going to make more people see it because they know that you're going to keep pushing out content that people are going to watch and they're going to stay on the app longer. So as you prove it out, so I could definitely see why using that on TikTok uh, also would be beneficial. And I, I just, again, I love the hack at like starting with local stuff or at least doing local stuff most of the time or have enough that you start to get your growth uh, that happens uh, because once you have the growth that happens and you can maybe start talking about other things. So, all right. So you started as, you know, essentially a buyer's agent at these new builds. You made a video. People were like, looks really cool. Be my agent. You go represent them. You buy these, these first ones. So now, so you've got a lot of incoming leads coming in. Yeah. What are some things that you do to make sure that essentially that you like do well with those leads that you represent them well that you maximize them? Like, do you have a CRM that afterward you're doing follow-up and now they've become, you know, have, have any of them become, you know, second or third customers and of them keep going. So like now that you've kind of mastered the incoming lead, mm-hmm. what are your secrets to do well and to grow your business uh, after that? That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, like I'm pretty, I'm not a very uh, organized person to be like completely honest. I know that's one of my weaknesses that I plan to, you know, at some point hire out. So I don't have a CRM that I put all these leads into, right? I just pretty much just violently post on social media every day. A lot of these customers have returned into, um, you know, second, third time customers and just, just be a human man. Like a lot of people, you know, use scripts and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with using scripts, but if you're going to use a script, find a way to make it, you know, the way you actually talk. Right. And I just take the approach that like, I'm going to tell people exactly what I think on every property. I'm going to be like, Hey, I wouldn't buy it for this reason. And this reason, I think this one's better for this reason. And this reason, right? Like I'm never going to try and get somebody to buy something just so I can make money. Right. I'm just going to tell them exactly what I think. Right. Cause I'm not coming from a place of scarcity where like, I need the money from this transaction or I need this, or I need that. Right. At the end of the day, I just want to service the client and that's the approach I've taken and it's worked out well for me. So. Yeah. So the, so now are you mostly, are you mostly a buyer's agent or what's your percentage uh, of buyers versus listings? Probably 60% buyers, 40% listings. I started getting a lot of listings because I started, once I started, you know, uploading listing videos and people realized that I did listings then I, oddly enough, started getting more calls for listings, right? So now that I have a lot of listings ongoing, I get a lot more calls for listings. And um, I I try to stay in the pre-sale niche. So like new construction slash listing homes, because I find that's the most scalable and leverageable thing that a real estate agent can do. I still work with buyers that want to buy resale homes and stuff like that. But obviously, they just take a lot more time than somebody who wants to buy a pre-sale or list a home, right? So they say list to last, right? Yeah. What's something that the, you know, that now a couple of years later, you wish you'd have known when you first got started? I wish I would have started YouTube right away. I think YouTube is, I love TikTok. That's done the best for me by far, but I still think YouTube is the best platform out there because it's a search engine. And because it's the problem with TikTok is as my followers grow, it doesn't mean that it's going to snowball and it's going to easy, get, get easier to grow more followers. If I want to get more followers, I have to consistently put out viral content. On YouTube, the more subs you have, it starts to snowball on top of itself and become easier to get more subs. And then also all of the people that are subscribed to your channel, your content pops up on their feed a lot more often, right? That's not necessarily the case on TikTok or Instagram, right? Whereas YouTube, it's just... It's the best mix of targeting a cold audience, but as well as retargeting your warm audience, which is your followers, right? Because that's why I call TikTok basically a brand awareness ad because it's all cold for the most part. It's you're hitting a cold audience every day. And then Instagram is, you know, a mix, but it's not as powerful as YouTube, I'd say. And then YouTube is definitely the most powerful, but it just takes, it takes so long to build up that momentum on there. And it's a very tough learning curve. So many people don't get into it, but I wish I started it right at the beginning because I'd be a lot further ahead right now. Like I'm just coming up on a thousand subs right now. Now I'm starting to book three or four appointments off my YouTube every week. And that has been a grind, man. Like it's been like out of everything I've done probably in my life, like 
getting like a thousand subscribers on YouTube has probably been like the hardest thing ever. But now I'm starting to see it. It's snowball. I'm getting three, four book deployments, people just booking right into my calendar. So uh, I wish I started at the beginning because that snowball would be a lot bigger by now. How many subscribers do you have on, on, uh, on TikTok? 30, almost 31,000. Cool. So that's grown. How about on like Instagram or Facebook? Instagram is 4,500. Uh, I've personally found Instagram hard to grow on. Uh, I post yeah. on there every day, uh, but just keep it at it. Just staying consistent, right? Just having that long-term vision. It'll happen, right? It's just the pro- it's, if the process has worked for everybody else, there's no way that it won't work for me. It's already been proven that it works. I just have to follow yeah. it, right? Uh, and then Facebook, I don't really use too much, to be, uh, to be honest. And then I'm at about okay. 8, 850 on YouTube. Got it. Cool. So the, so you started with TikTok, you've grown the other one. Instagram's grown a little faster than YouTube. YouTube has been a grind, but you think that's the best long-term plan that's out there. And I've met tons of agents that when they got to a certain spot on YouTube, they, they, yeah, that an infinite amount of listings because people would go, you know, look for certain things. It would, they'd say, they type in things to do in Fayetteville because they're thinking about moving to Fayetteville. And if the video comes up for, here's the thing to do in Fayetteville, like that's the agent they're going to go ask about it next, or they're going to go through the other things. Yeah. So kind of related to what I've seen with other people. If somebody today says, wow, I, all right, so I need to go start a TikTok. We've already talked about like what they can do in there. Even just simple videos, very localized, make sure people know it's in the market that you're in because it needs to get attraction. You need people in your market to actually give it attention. And if so, that'll grow. Cool. TikTok, we figured out. Um, and then posting every day. And like staying consistent yeah. with that content. Um, so in YouTube, if someone's going to get started in YouTube, right? Like you took, it was a grind for you to get to a thousand. Yeah. What are like, are there certain video types that you thought did better or certain video types that are getting you more leads? Or if somebody was like, okay, I'm ready to start YouTube. I don't know what to make videos about. Like what advice would you give them? Like what videos should they be doing? What should they be starting with? Like what sort of content should they be putting there? All right. I'll give you a bunch of ideas right now related to my market. Okay. Five things I wish I knew before moving to Abbotsford. Top three pros and cons of Abbotsford. Top three neighborhoods in Abbotsford. Top three worst neighborhoods in Abbotsford. Uh, Abbotsford vlog tour. And then you could even break it down by all the little sub neighborhoods and do a vlog tour of every single sub neighborhood. And then you can even go to like every city around your local market and shoot all of these same videos. Like they're literally infinite how many of these videos you can do right um uh what's it called um uh cost of living in abbotsford um all the all these videos are evergreen and they last forever see the thing with youtube that tiktok and instagram don't have is the it's leverageable forever right you spend two hours three hours making one video and that video could literally prospect for you for the rest of your career like I have, you know, videos that I put out when I first started YouTube almost a year ago that are still like, if you look at the views on the analytics, it's still just going up in a straight line like this, right? Like it hasn't stopped. So, and you know, I have another, there's another age in my market. I was talking to him. He closed two deals off a YouTube that he shot three years ago last month. So, you know, the way that I look at it on YouTube, like TikTok can get you deals today. Like I shot a video on a presale last week. And then I got a text. They're like, Hey, I put a deposit down on one of those units on that video that you shot and put your name on the contract. <laughs> I That's didn't even crazy. Talk to the guy, right? So yeah, I like, met the guy and you're getting credit for it. That's crazy. Yeah. Like that's how powerful TikTok is. Like TikTok will get you business today, but YouTube will build a sustainable business for the rest of your career, right? Like the way I look at it is just like every video I put out is somebody sitting in a call center making cold calls for me. And I want to put out as many of those videos as I can. Right. Dude, that's so brilliant. So, I mean, so that's the formula, right? For people that are thinking about a pivot or thinking about making a switch or you're stuck or you're just getting started. Like the, it's talking about growing TikTok and YouTube at the same time, like putting the content out there. Cause you need that W2 income now to get started. You need something to like to pay the bills. Like YouTube isn't going to pay the bills for a year or two. But man, in a few years, it's going to be paying a lot of bills, right? Exactly. You're going to be getting a ton more. And the and just those ideas, I love that idea too of even by sub market. Like Austin has so many different like sub markets that people know about. And there's, uh, you know, so t- top pros and cons of reasons to go, go live at Barton Creek Country Club. Top pros and cons to go live in Terrytown. There's all these like areas and neighborhoods, especially with people are thinking about moving to Austin from other places. 
They're like, exactly. okay, what's the difference of this? And someone goes, oh, you got to live in Terrytown, or you got to live on the east side, or you got to live on this. So there's these submarkets. I hadn't thought about people re- researching those submarkets too and wanting to see the videos. I had seen a lot of like pros and cons of, of moving to Austin, you know, five things I wish I'd known before moving here, that sort of stuff. But I could see the submarkets too becoming powerful because usually those people are looking at two or three submarkets. So the most that you put in there are neighborhoods, things like that. Uh, the more you put in there, the more you push. Exactly. All right, so what's your average? So when you do that new build, that guy goes to a new build, put your name down on there. How much do they pay you? Um, anywhere from, it depends on the price of the unit, but I want to say the average for a pre-sale is probably around 5,500 bucks, six grand maybe. And then, but I've had so I've sold pre-sales where the commission is like 20,000. It just depends yeah. on the developer and how much they're spending and stuff like that. And I'm on a split too. So I manage a team of about 25 agents. Um, but I am still on a split. So 30% of my commission goes to the top as well. So it'd probably be, you know, 9,000 roughly. Eight, yeah. eight or 9,000. Phenomenal. So you get a guy writes down your name, goes in there, you're getting a, a commission, you go help him, you go represent him, you do the, the contracts up. But most of the new build people, they kind of want to do the handoff. They want you to then stay out of the way and then just get your referral. So I love that for people, especially so in, in uh, the United States, you know, two years ago, new builds made up like 10 or 11% of total sales. Uh, and right now they're making up like 30% of total sales. Wow. Uh, because that's where the supply is coming from. So there's so much more. So if you're not already, if you're an agent and you haven't started bringing your buyers to new builds and you haven't started, you know, making that happen, you should, because that's where all the supply is coming from. I mean, the, essentially the supply of regular single family resales has gone down significantly. And so now, now new homes are 30% of the inventory, uh, which is huge. It's huge, huge, huge numbers. Uh, for the comparison. And then that, those are easy things to go try to make some of that content that Connor's talking about here. Like here's a new development. Here's a, you can walk through the model home. You can take some videos. You can you know let them know. the. And when you go do walk through those model homes and do the videos, you're going to hear that the builder this week is doing an incentive to buy a rate down to 4% or, Hey, they're doing this. So you get to tell them something that's like newsworthy providing value also. Like, exactly. hey, let me know if you, I'm, I'm here. This is what they've got. You know, if you want to, if you want a list of the ones that they actually are marketed right now, let me know. Really cool stuff. Really cool ideas to grow that. So now you've, um, you've, you've got your leads, you've grown your way to make some money now. And then also your way to get leads two or three years from now, essentially YouTube works in, in the way that if you stop posting everything, like, so two or three years from now, let's say you decide to stop posting anything. You're not going to get much from TikTok anymore, but you'll get leads for the rest of your life on YouTube. And if you decide to not be an agent anymore, you'll get a lead on YouTube that you can refer to somebody else. So I, I do love the, the evergreen content average totally. price point of the houses that you're doing over there. Uh, well, a detached house in Abbotsford is about 1.1 million. I want to say like one, one five. Um, but you know, I'm Abbotsford to Surrey, which is about 40 minutes, 30 minutes away. So I want to say the average price point is, you know, probably around 1.3. If you already, you know, put everything on aggregate condos, townhomes and detached, it would probably be like somewhere in the 800 thousands. I want to say like 850 or something like that would probably be the average. So the, the average commission ends up being eight to 10,000 here, I believe. Hey, real estate rock stars. We only have a few minutes left in this episode, but before we get to the grand finale, I just wanted to say, as always, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. You know, podcasts are obviously free. You don't have to pay to listen to the podcast, but if you could pay one thing, if I could charge you one thing to listen to this podcast, what I would ask you to do is go, please make a review. Go to wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's on YouTube or on Apple or Android, wherever you listen to podcasts and go give me a review of the podcast. I read them. I listen to them. I try to make adjustments. You know, a couple years ago, I had a ton of bad reviews on the sound quality or the number of advertisements, things like that. And I've really tried to dial in to add value for all of you guys. So please, please, please go do a review. If you want to get a, a, a copy of the toolbox of the stuff that you know, everybody that comes on the show, they give us some tactics. They give us something that we put in what we call our toolbox. And so to get that, you go to realestaterockstarsnetwork.com. When you get there, click on the, the toolbox and you get access to the free gift that every person that we interview on the episode provides. There's things like, you know, uh, listing tactics, how to do a presentation, you know, how to do a newsletter, all sorts of cool, fun stuff. And if you want to talk to me, go find me on Instagram at Aaron Amuchastegui. Ask me a question. I talked to so many of you guys on there. All right, back to the show. Thanks again for being a listener. Cool. Yeah. Well, the, the, I mean, 
this interview has been really awesome. I think we hit so many things I was really hoping we could, but something you just mentioned that kind of threw me off that I've got to ask at least one or two more questions on is, so you said you also manage a big team. How many people on the team you manage? There's about 25 or 26 agents right now, I think. So how did you decide? So you've been in the, in the business two years. Yeah. Why did you decide to manage a team? How did you decide to manage a team? And or any advice for somebody that's either thinking about managing a team or struggling with it? Like, so what, what, what advice could you give about that? Why'd you do it? And what advice could you give for whether someone should, or if they already are, what works? I love coaching. I love being able to change somebody's perspective on something and just set them in a completely different direction or give them that new fire to their life just by changing their perspective. Because, because essentially that's what coaching is. It's just changing somebody's perspective and resetting their mindset. So I started on that team as just, you know, one of the agents on that team. And then, you know, it got to the point where I was doing a bunch of deals and then the owner of the team was just like, Hey, why don't you just manage the team with me? Because I want to retire in a couple of years anyway. So I was like, sure. So, you know, then I've been managing the team and now I get a cut of every deal that happens. And, um, you know, it's not a significant amount of money, but it definitely is nice to have that sustained income as I'm trying, as I'm reinvesting into my business and growing my business, I'm going to be buying a house soon. And you know, that it's going to be like a $7,000 mortgage at these rates. So, it's nice to have that income from the team, definitely. But ultimately, I'm just, I'm just, it sounds cliche. I'm passionate about helping people. And that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to switch from plumbing into to real estate is I just felt like it would be more fulfilling being able to help people via their finances or the biggest, you know, move of their life. And then I, I always kind of knew I wanted to be an influencer just because I was kind of following the same path as meet Kevin and Graham Stefan and a lot of these people on the bigger pockets podcast. I knew I wanted to be an influencer so I could influence more people to be able to help more people. So um, once I got the opportunity to basically coach a team of agents, I was all over it because that's what I wanted to do anyways. Okay. You get to influence the people right in front of you. Well, Connor, I wish I had more time to dig into other stuff today. The, that interview flew by so much great info for our people out there and our listeners. I think everybody's going to be really excited and taking notes and maybe go back and listen to it again, but there's going to be people that are now going to want to go find you on TikTok. They're going to want to find you on Instagram. They're going to ask you questions. They want to see your YouTube. What's the best way people can find you? Or send you referrals for people that are coming up there. So mm -hmm. Abbotsford's near near Vancouver. You know, if they're trying to connect with you, where can they see the stuff that you're doing for ideas and how can they reach you? At that agent Kelly, all one word on all platforms. Uh, more than happy to help you guys out if you want to shoot me a DM. Awesome. Cool. I hope you guys go find Connor on there at that agent Kelly. The man, I think that I need to go start a TikTok. Uh, right now the or start putting more time into my youtube stuff but for those of you guys that have been listening the, you know the way to find me to come talk to me the, the place that i'm the most addicted to where i have the most conversations and where i'm currently putting out the mo most content even though maybe next week it'll be tiktok instead come find me on instagram it's at aaron and if you type a-a-r-o-n and a-m-u you're gonna find me i'm the only one uh, after that don't worry you don't have to type my whole name uh to find it or we have our real estate rockstars instagram where we repost clips of just the podcast and that's at re rockstars connor this was so much fun today i'm glad i got a chance to talk to you loving it man thanks a lot for having me on yeah eh? real estate rockstars thanks for listening